welcome to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Sarin. At approximately 4.40 p.m. on Tuesday, November 7, 2006, federal authorities at Chicago O'Hare International Airport received a report that a group of 12 airport employees were witnessing a metallic, saucer-shaped craft hovering over gate C-17. According to eyewitness reports, the strange object was first spotted by a ramp employee who was pushing back United Airlines Flight 446, which was departing Chicago for Charlotte, North Carolina. The ramp worker then apprised the flight crew of United Airlines 446 of the existence of the spinning metallic object above their aircraft. And it is believed that both the pilot and co-pilot of this aircraft also witnessed the object at the same time. Several independent witnesses outside of the airport also witnessed the object. One of these witnesses describes a blatant disc-shaped craft hovering over the airport, which was obviously not clouds. According to this witness, several nearby observers gasped as the object shot through the clouds at high velocity, leaving a clear blue hole in the cloud layer. On this episode of The Conspiracy Show, we'll examine the Chicago O'Hare UFO incident. I sat down and discussed the O'Hare UFO incident with a newspaper reporter with the Chicago Tribune and a couple of UFO researchers who maintain the buzz over the O'Hare sighting is fully justified because of the quality of the witnesses and the documents that were generated. And as usual, I also sat down and listened to a skeptic who maintains the UFO incident can simply be described as a strange weather phenomenon. Me, I just want the truth and I'm willing to follow it wherever it leads. It is time to redefine reality. What happened over Chicago's O'Hare Airport on November 7th, 2006? We really have one of the iconic uh, UFO encounters in, in modern history. And this is at Chicago's O'Hare Airport, one of the largest and busiest airports in the world. Uh, roughly 15 people or so, at the least, witnessed this thing in the sky. Now, there was a cloud cover that day, approximately 10,000 feet in clouds. Below that cloud was an object. It was there for possibly 10 minutes, possibly a little longer. It shot off so rapidly, so powerfully, that, according to the witnesses, it punched a hole through the clouds. And it shouldn't be there. This is Class B airspace. And at Concourse C, Gate C-17, there was a jet sitting there, ready, getting ready to take off. And uh, I believe it was 446 was the number. And uh, some people working at the ramp looked up. They were, for some reason, drawn to the sky. And they noticed that there was this object below the cloud cover. The cloud cover that day was about 1,900 feet. And this appeared to be somewhere around 400 some feet below the cloud cover. It caught their attention. This object shouldn't be there. It was rotating in a counterclockwise, but yet it appeared to mask itself or be pretty similar in coloration as the cloud cover itself, but yet it was discernible as being something different. This individual contacted both the pilot and co-pilot, then contacted the manager, his manager. The manager came down, looked at it, contacted the tower. Before he knew it, a whole series of conversations were going on over the radio. The United Witnesses all spoke to the senior management about the encounter, and they were told in no uncertain terms that they were not supposed to talk about this at all. One person reported that sighting to the National UFO Reporting Center, which is on the web, and described it there. There, the story sat for uh, a couple of months until the Chicago Tribune journalist, John Hilkovich, got wind of it. And John Hilkovich's beat was transportation. Well, uh, if this had happened, I, I guess, anywhere else in the Chicago area, I would not have had an interest. To, it, it, this happened on one of my beats, O'Hare International Airport.
And as I got underway in reporting, uh, the fact that the quality of these witnesses was so high. I mean, these were pilots, these were mechanics that were taxiing aircraft, uh, ramp attendants, uh, you know, individuals who are very familiar with the airport environment and really have eagle eyes and are able to spot, you know, just ordinary aircraft uh, from miles away and even tell you what type they are uh, when it looks to the average person as a pin in the sky. So the fact that these were very credible uh, witnesses and that they were all telling the same story about this gray disc-shaped object uh, above gate C-17 at O'Hare and uh, just its, its, its size, its altitude, whether or not it was spinning, and then after a few minutes, how it abruptly just exited the airspace by uh, piercing this uh, donut-shaped hole in an overcast sky uh, was very unusual. I mean, an airplane with its wings doesn't make this kind of uh, signature. It makes this a stronger than average case in terms of witness testimony. When, a, when an airline pilot is unable to identify an aerial object, you have to assume that that, that matters. I mean, these are the guys who their job is to know everything that's supposed to be in the air because they would they encounter it. They need to know what's out there. They knew this was a, a concern from a safety point of view, and this is really all this gentleman was, was doing and everybody else was bringing up the fact that this is a blatant violation of security. All totaled, how many witnesses at O'Hare did you speak to? Well over a dozen witnesses, and then after the story appeared, uh, there were more people who came forward uh, who were passengers in the terminal or people in nearby suburbs ringing O'Hare who also saw something and uh, described it in a similar fashion. If it wasn't for the involvement, of course, of John Bilkovich pursuing it further, threading a FOIA, uh, I think to this day they would say nothing transpired at all. Uh, the initial witness, and not just him, but everybody else, uh, met, of course, some sort of uh, ardent uh, resistance. This was UAL. They knew this was a, a concern from a safety point of view, and this is really all this gentleman was, was doing, and everybody else was bringing up the fact that this is a blatant violation of security. This was a security concern, if more than anything. Here are these objects there that shouldn't be there. It's obviously something very unusual. High-level management want to basically put it under the rug as fast as they can. John Hilkovich's piece on the O'Hare UFO incident ran in January 2007 under the headline, In the Sky, a bird, a plane, a UFO. It attracted more than 1.6 million page views on the online edition the most in the history of chicagotribune.com. So the whole thing exploded. When the Tribune uh, article came out, it was with John Hilkovich, it got more hits on their website than any other story they had ever had. United Airlines was forced then to admit that yes, indeed, they had looked into it. They had to admit that they had been lying and, and all of that. So I went on to do Freedom of Information Act requests. We got uh, logs from O'Hare Tower showing that there were various reports radioed in from uh, different parts of the airfield, uh, and uh, also uh, FAA tapes, where we actually have uh, the discourse between air traffic controllers in O'Hare Tower and pilots and planes. You know, did you see this? Yeah, I saw it, but it's gone now. You know, stuff like that. So clearly, uh, there was, for whatever reason, uh, some kind of denial, or you could say cover-up. At that point, the story begins to break, and FAA also made one denial after another. We discovered through investigation that these are both bold-faced lies. United was very much involved in trying to understand what this was, as was the FAA. Or at the very least, they were involved in trying to clamp down on the information reaching the general public. They just did not want this coming out. Well, if any of the United Airlines uh, personnel were, shall we say, discouraged from discussing it, I think it's the same as with the bureaucracies anywhere, government or business bureaucracies. It's avoid bad publicity at all times, at all cost. If you're part of the federal bureaucracy like the FAA, and somebody reports seeing a UFO and you don't know what they saw, 
and you don't know what they're reporting. You don't want some reporter coming to you and saying, tell me about this and you're gonna have to say that you don't know what it is. That's bad publicity. Much better to say, I didn't see it, there was nothing reported. Just deny it. Well, it's entirely possible. United was going through uh, real financial trouble, bankruptcy proceedings. And I don't know if it was the, the bankruptcy per se or just an overall feeling among management that you don't want to be known as the UFO airline. They did put the hammer down on their employees who were talking to me. A photograph one was going to photograph others. They were willing to give their names and be interviewed uh, with full disclosure. And uh, both the airline and in the case of uh, Airline Pilots Association, ALPA, the pilots union, uh, they both told their members uh, not to talk. So, you know, I was at the point of my reporting where I had their names, I had pictures, and, you know, clearly I told them early on, uh, you're on the record, and they agreed to that. Uh, but then after they got all this pressure uh, with threats of, you know, punishment and possible termination, uh, I decided I could still tell the story. Uh, I could, uh, you know, prove to my editors that we had real people here, real credible people here, and we were able to tell the story without jeopardizing anybody's jobs. Now, if your policy or your philosophy is to deny absolutely that there are UFOs, what are you left with but weather phenomena? You have nothing else. They were stating it was a lenticular cloud underneath the um, overcast that we had that day, which was a serious overcast. It was getting darker out, but the lighting wasn't, wouldn't have, would have been diffused, of course, by the natural light, which was enough at that period of time. So both explanations were foolish. I think the most likely explanation is that there was what's called a hole punch cloud. It's, it's basically when ice crystals fall on clouds a certain way and it makes a circular hole in it. Now, some of the UFO proponents have said that isn't possible because at the, the, the ceiling was low and the temperature of the ceiling, at the level of the ceiling was above freezing and therefore this ice crystals couldn't form and so therefore this wasn't possible. That would be true, however, if there was a second, usually such things occur at a much higher elevation than just 5,000 or 10,000 feet, whatever the, the lower level was. A break, however, in the clouds at, the, at the, the lower ceiling would reveal whatever was above. And if above was a higher level cloud with hole punch occurring, people would have seen it for a short time. And then when the, um, when it went, uh, you know, when the, when the ceiling close together again, then it would appear to have gone away. What's very interesting is if you look at the website of uh, NOAA, National uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, that has been set up for a hole punch cloud that to explain what this thing is, they will show you uh, a photo they took in Wisconsin, and it turns out it was actually something like two to three weeks just after this. In other words, it's the same region of the country, the same general time of year, and they had a really nice hole punch cloud on their website there. It was just the same year, you know, within you know, a few weeks of the O'Hare incident. So I really think that's likely what it is. Now, here's, here's what I say about that. The only reason they call it a weather phenomenon is because they absolutely, positively cannot, must not ever admit that it was a craft of some sort, which is what everyone said it was. All of the witnesses said it was an object, a craft, not natural phenomenon. Every single one of the witnesses, every one. Now, if your policy or your philosophy is to deny absolutely that there are UFOs, what are you left with but weather phenomena? You have nothing else. You have to grasp at those straws, and that's, that's all that they've done. Flight crews are not necessarily um, trained to uh, recognize and identify weather phenomena. In fact, I believe it was one of the servers who, uh, you know, reported seeing this. It was not the pilots, I don't think. Nothing turned up on radar. I would think that if there were any object hovering over a hair field, especially at a low altitude, not only would it be seen by far more people all over the region, not just a few scattered people who report. In fact, I believe they were mostly all in this one gate. Well, it should have been seen much more widely and it should have turned up on radar. 
So the fact that it didn't suggest it really wasn't a solid object, that it was just something that looked a little bizarre. And, I, and I, having seen these hole punch clouds, they can look very bizarre. Radar reports and uh, the actual radar data, which you have to get in the United States in a period of 15 days. Anomalies were seen. I believe there were um, some indications that something was there during that period of time. The other thing is the short period of time and the fact that it was stationary and not moving makes it very difficult for it to be recorded. If it was moving, it would be recorded. But their line all the, all the way has been uh, that this was some kind of a weather phenomenon, uh, that this was some kind of light show uh, at O'Hare that played tricks on the eyes of all these people. Uh, but these witnesses were people that have worked there for years under all sorts of weather conditions and such. So with that kind of uh, veracity and uh, ability to identify things, uh, they were clear this was not runway lights bouncing off the pavement onto the sky. Uh, this was, to them, a real object of some sort, and it merited an investigation both from a security and safety standpoint. Uh, FAA's longstanding policy is that if any individuals uh, report what they consider a, a UFO, is that they should dial 911, call local law enforcement, or call the uh, uh, National UFO Reporting Center. But the FAA itself really washes its hands of this issue completely. Well, one thing skeptics are entirely right in asking for is physical evidence of this case, uh, at least in at least, if nothing else, a, a bona fide photograph. And it is said that, that at least one and, and possibly several photographs were taken. Uh, at, at least what I had read was that the pilot of the aircraft had a camera in and took at least one picture of the sun. Many photographs were taken. Uh, I don't know if these individuals were intimidated, if they gave that voluntarily. Whether they visited O'Hare uh, on November 6, uh, 2006, I don't know. We had no intention of uh, ignoring that story once the various factors came to light. Now, it could be uh, some kind of black budget, uh, clandestine prototype technology, I suppose. Although, you might wonder, why would this be employed over O'Hare Airport. If they are, and they're just not brought to light, I'm not not really sure. The mannerism, the way they did this, and, and, the, and the way they made people feel foolish for coming forward is not proper conduct. You know, whether it was uh, a, a drone or some other kind of uh, scientific or military, uh, you know, aircraft, uh, we'll never know. Uh, you know, the, the witnesses I dealt with, as I said, were highly credible. I don't think I don't think it was a light show. I don't think they were tricked by anything. We don't have any photos. We don't have any radar. Uh, this thing was there for maybe four minutes. If it was there, it appeared to suddenly depart and, uh, you know, never came back. So all the planets and, and life forms that have to be out there in the age of the universe, I personally, yeah, I believe there's a other forms of life. Whether they visited O'Hare uh, on November 6, uh, 2006, I don't know. But uh, we certainly, you know, we had no intention of uh, ignoring that story once the various factors came to light. They saw an extraordinary object, an extraordinary craft take off from motionlessness to instant acceleration. Isn't anyone in the least bit curious as to what type of object can do that? What is its source of energy? What are the implications that might have for our own society, our own energy paradigm in our world today? And then another question might be to ask, why is there so much obfuscation and cover-up and denial about this? I think those are a few issues right off the top of my head as to why the O'Hare UFO incident still matters to this day. The official party line on the Chicago O'Hare UFO incident was this was simply a weather phenomenon. It was an overcast day, and that combined with the twilight and various lights at the airport could potentially create an optical illusion or two. I've seen pictures and videos of whole punch clouds. Believe me, they're remarkable things to behold. We've posted some pictures of them on the website. I can see how one could mistake a punch hole cloud for a UFO, but a pilot? That's a little harder to swallow. And if it was just a punch hole cloud, 
Why did the FAA deny there were any reports? But they were then forced to change their story after that reporter with the Chicago trip filed a freedom of information request. If it was just a punch hole cloud, why did United Airlines order its employees not to talk about the incident? I don't believe it was a punch hole cloud. I'm not convinced it was a craft of extraterrestrial origin either. The American author Libba Bay wrote, people have a habit of inventing fictions they will believe wholeheartedly in order to ignore the truth they cannot accept. Sometimes those people who have a habit of inventing fictions in order to ignore the truth they cannot accept are skeptics. And now I'd like to know what you think. You can contact me here through the website at theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid.